Welcome back and dzień dobry. Today's episode is dedicated to Polish women and we will talk about specifically two women who went abroad and left the homeland for fame and fortune in the bigger world. So the first book we're going to talk about is Rosa Montero's La Ridicula Idea de No Volver a Verte, The Silly or Outrageous Idea of Never Seeing or Meeting You Again, which was published in 2013. So this book by the Spanish author is some sort of essay slash memoir slash biography about the woman who was Marie Skłodowska, better known as Marie Curie, who is the great scientist who came to France and who went on to, of course, win not just one, but two Nobel Prizes for her great achievements. Now, the book kind of centers on her, but also on what happened to Pierre. So Pierre Curie, he was not just her husband, but he was also her partner and her friend. And he died in a fatal traffic accident in 1906. And after his death, Marie Curie actually wrote a sort of diary where she kind of, you know, tries to cope with her unimaginable grief and loss. And this diary only has about maybe 20, 30 pages or so. It's it's actually quite slim as a whole, but this is where she kind of pours out her heart after the unimaginable has happened. Rosa Montero was at first asked to write, I believe, a shorter text about this diary, but then she read it and was really touched by the words and what she saw in Marie Curie. She read more books about her. And most importantly, Rosa Montero at that time herself was struggling with her own loss, with her own grief because her partner had died. So she was very much touched by the diary, by the words of Marie Curie. And she set out to write this book, La Ridicula Idea de No Volver a Verte, where she kind of explores the themes of marriage and love, also sex, but more specifically in the broader sense, the question of women in science and the world, also the relationship between mothers and daughters. So she really touches on a lot of different things, starting off from Marie Curie. Now, overall, this is a very interesting or fascinating read, but I have to say that I personally really struggled with the style. After like every five or six pages, there's supposed to be like some sort of epiphany when Rosa Montero is like, did you ever think about this? And I mean, wow. So there's really kind of this chattiness to it that I kind of could not get into. And most importantly, she a lot of the times also just puts words with hashtags in front of them in the text for apparently no real reason. Now, I get that this got published in 2014, but I don't think this really was great back then or has aged well. Because for me, it kind of, especially when you read something that's a bit more tragic or where you're really in, you know, in the text itself, it kind of always kind of pulled me out again in a really kind of uncomfortable way. But I don't know, maybe if you read this, you know, uh, as an ebook or something, then you can perhaps click on, you know, the hashtag feminism, hashtag mujeres, hashtag whatever, and then explore other things. But in the book itself, to me, it just did not make sense. Like, I didn't see the added value of putting those hashtags in the text all over the place. And the funny thing was actually that... Uh, a friend of mine gave me this book as a gift and then she asked me, so did you like it? And I was like, well, yeah, there's great bits, you know, in it, but not quite as much as I wanted to or expected to. And she was like, no, damn it. You know, I'm not the biggest fan of Rosa Montero, but the, the woman in the bookstore, she was really like, oh, it's a great book. You, she'll, your friend will definitely love it. And we were both like, no, ah, damn it. But Overall, usually I think you can trust your bookstore 
seller or librarian, they usually know know their stuff. The second book is a novel and is called In America and was published by Susan Sontag in 1999. So this is quite different and it is a book about the famous, illustrious and wonderful actress Helena Mojejewska, who in the novel is called Marina Zalewska. So the thing with uh, Helena Mojejewska is uh, slightly different. Now she actually did not go to the States in search of fame and fortune, because she had fame and fortune where she was. She was actually the most renowned, the most celebrated, the most venerated, the most loved Polish actress of her time in 1860s, 1870s. So she kind of had it made, but there is something happening in her life. There's sort of dissatisfaction or something that kind of pushes her away. As a note, we also need to remember that at that time, Poland as a country, as a state, does not officially exist. So there are also like some political things on the ground that might impact or might have impacted her decision. But overall, it's just her wanting to leave. And she does not want to go to America as an actress. No, no. She wants to lead a bucolic life and a Rousseau-like adventure. So with a group of Polish comrades and her husband and her young son, she goes all the way to California, to Anaheim, where she settles down in a farm called Arden, which you can still visit today. And there she kind of starts off on this pastoral, peasanty adventure where she's in touch with nature and she kind of follows the principles of uh, Fourier, where we are in a socialist utopia and everyone is kind of living together in this kind of like, tight-knit community and takes care of the land, of the earth, etc, etc. Now, evidently, things don't always pan out the way we expect, and the same holds true for Helena Mojejewska and her Polish friends, because very quickly they realize that, of course, Anaheim and Arden is not just kind of this magical place, Eden, where everything is going to go swimmingly and wonderfully well. Things start going really badly, the whole utopia crumbles, and many of the Poles actually decide to go back to Europe. Not Elena, though. She now says, I am Helena Mojejewska, I will now become an actress again. So she kind of embarks on her comeback and she does actually become one of the most celebrated actresses in the US at the time, traveling all around the country. She's celebrated, loved, she also meets other people from the time, of course, for example, Edwin Booth, and she kind of re-establishes her life. Is she content? It's not quite clear from the novel. But this is kind of where we leave her off when she's kind of like barging on, continuing with her show, with her act. Now, funnily enough, this is also a book I kind of got from a friend. I think the reasoning behind it was that it talks about Polish people and I'm a Slav, so hey presto, which no, I think it was a kind of like nice, uh, nice thing to do. She was like, oh, I think you will really enjoy this. And I have to say the first time I read the book, I did kind of fall into it. I just kind of went with it. Uh, also, I mean, I like history and I liked finding out about Helena Mojejewska and, you know, her, her shenanigans in Europe and in the US. But on the second reading, a couple of years back, I have to say I was kind of a bit more, yeah, I'm not sure, because I kind of already knew the story and then I guess I just paid more attention to to, to what she was doing as a writer. And it's it's an interesting book or or bag of a book because she does jump around, around a lot style-wise. At the beginning, she actually inserts herself in the story a bit and then there's chunks of the book where we 
or where she pushes forward the story through letters and there's another one where we just see the diaries of her husband for example and talking about diaries there's actually this really lovely kind of quote because we were talking about uh, diaries also with Marie Curie and he writes in one diary entry March 30th the defect of keeping a diary is that I note mostly what ruffles my temper. Tonight I could pen a whole sermon on the ugliness of a loveless marriage. Wanda has taken to wearing her hair pulled back and in frizzed bangs. Le dernier cri, apparently, among the ladies of the village. And Julian is merciless. So yeah, there we have like a... Uh, very different kind of like styles mixed about. And I have to say, I, it's funny to see that the book actually uh, elicits very different kind of uh, sorts of feedback. Now it won actually quite a few accolades and, and awards, but at the same time, I think there's one review where the critic actually says, if this would not have been written by Susan Sontag, nobody would even bat an eye and pay attention to it. When I was reading kind of these bad reviews, I was thinking of another book, and that is Matthias Wiegener's 2500 Random Things About Me. And in it, there is this hilarious random thing. So he says, I think Susan Sontag was a good reader, not a great thinker and definitely not a fiction writer. So yeah, you be the judge, of course. And there's another kind of like random thing that I found funny, since we are talking about Europe and people coming to America, and he says the following. There was a running joke in my family based on something my mother once said on a trip in the Adirondacks. Das könnte in Europa sein. So for a long time, anything that was special or nice could be in Europe. A nice painting, a forest, or a good yogurt. Now, when I was thinking of Sontag, then I also thought of her film Promised Lands. And of course, when you think of Promised Lands, then I was thinking of Palestine. And when I was thinking of Palestine, then I was thinking of Edward Said, which then brought me to another Polish person at this time, the writer Joseph Conrad. In his 2018 Edward Said Memorial Lecture, Hisham Matur looks at Edward Said and Joseph Conrad and tries to kind of make a comparison between these two, saying that, of course, not just where they came from was very pivotal in or for their writing, but also where they ended up in, in the environment which they went to. Now, this thought itself to me is not so groundbreaking because yes if you have some guy from Castelo Branco in Portugal of course his life was probably very different depending on whether he went in the 1960s to work in France or whether he went for example to Toronto Canada evidently the person he was in Castelo Branco in Portugal was you know, the same, but then like uh, the path di diverges depending on where he went to. And we could say the same thing, you know, of course, for um, Maria and Helena, depending on, you know, where they go or where they went, that also very much influenced their, their life. You know, imagine what would have happened to Marie Curie if she had gone, for example, to California or if Helena would have gone to Paris as, for example, Chopin, Chopin. So probably it would have been quite a different life and Marie Curie would not be called Marie Curie. Now, having talked about Polish women, of course, we cannot mention at least one Polish writer and I will point out Wisława Szymborska, the Nobel Prize laureate, who, well, has written countless wonderful poems and there is kind of a connection with what we've been talking about here because it's a lot also about, well, growing up, changing oneself, but also a sort of transmutation into somebody else, somebody new, through the simple act of, I guess, becoming an adult or growing old, but also of like putting yourself into or in a different environment. 
So Szymborska actually has this lovely poem called Teenager, and in it she says, We differ so profoundly, talk and think about completely different things. She knows next to nothing, but with a doggedness deserving better causes. I know much more, but not for sure. Going from Poland to, to Spain, because, well, Rosa Montero is a Spanish writer, I did in the context of women and their husbands and their husbands dying and the women then reflecting on their relationships with them, I kind of thought of some Spanish language books that maybe somehow fit this category. So there's uh, Andres Neumann's Hablar Solos, which I believe is translated, I guess the title is Talking to Ourselves, and then there's also Miguel de Libes, Cinco Horas con Mario, Five Hours with Mario. So yeah, you could also maybe check out these two books. As for film or musical suggestions, well, I guess I could go for the obvious Chopin, but let's say that's a little bit too on the nose. So we'll go in the completely other direction and I'll suggest a punk song. Yes. So there's this punk band called Brudne Dzieci Sida, which loosely translates to Sid's Dirty Kids, and they have some sort of song in which at one point they say, Ale ja, jestem punk, jubim laski z małymi cickami, which kind of loosely translates to, but me, I'm a punk, I like women with small breasts, because, you know, I'm a punk and I'm not an imperialist swine and I, I don't, I'm not into, you know, big, big chested women. So it's kind of a really silly song that for some reason kind of holds some sentimental value for me, so I'm just going to put it here. As for films, of course, there's uh, there's the classic science fiction cult film called Sex Misia from 1984. It's it's a Polish extravaganza with like very much do-it-yourself costumes. I'm not sure it aged well, but well, I'll just yeah mention it and then you can look it up for yourself. Then there is also Sticking with the theme of marriage, the film Vesele, The Wedding from 2004, which also just kind of shows you wedding celebrations going pretty much badly. <laughs> it's all like all over the place, but I don't know. I, for some reason also I have fond memories of, of the film. And if you want to indulge in ASMR, well... <laughs> because there's everything on the internet. I don't know how, but for some reason, I don't know, I was searching for something and then I think I was already working on this and just for the heck of it, I like typed in ASMR Susan Sontag. And of course there are ASMR videos about Susan Sontag. There's actually two, I believe from the same channel, but still. And there is actually also a really funny one um, about Hunter S. Thompson, which is just hilarious. So there you have it. If you're more into that, knock yourselves out. And now I think that's pretty much it for today. We're booked out. And if you want more Polish women, well, I guess on YouTube you can check out Karolina Zebrowska's channel about fashion and other interesting tidbits. I think she even did a video on Marie Curie. So I guess in honor of her and Polish women in general, I will now recite the only Polish tongue twister I know that I, of course, learned during a Polish wedding with a lot of vodka. So let's do it. Król Karol kupił królowej Karolinie korale koloru koralowego. Thank you for watching and cześć and bye bye.